So when you're talking and doing your interviews, mm. you know, it's not about you, is it? It's no, it's purely about the fighter. Exactly, which mm. is good, but I'm seeing your growth and I'm looking at mm. what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, everyone can look at, there's a million interviews on fighters, but when I see someone who's, you know, doing their own thing, going out, grafting, like you mm. say, you've got a door to provide for, and you just want, a be- mm. I'm assuming you just want better quality of life, but you also want to do something that you love. Mm. So that's that's tr- it. You know, um, you've, got to in- you've got to enjoy what you're doing, you've got to love what you're doing. And yes. fortunately for me, I love boxing, so... Um, Where did that love start? Where did it start? Where did it start? I mean, it's very cliche, but it started off when I was very young watching like the Rocky films. Okay, okay. I say cliche. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I never envisaged being a boxer or, or taking a boxing until I was thirty-three. So what what effectively happened was I was in a very like low point in my life. Yes. Um, I'd lost my job. Um, didn't have a car. Okay. I was living in a one-bedroom council flat in Bestwood. Um, I was out of shape, and um, I was. You know, I was at rock bottom, yeah. and then one day um, I took a walk to the local co-op to, to buy a newspaper and a pint of milk. Um, and when I come out the shop, there was a little poster in the window, and it was it was sort of styled like a 1940s World War II rec- recruitment poster. But it was Lord Kitchener pointing the finger and saying, "We need you. Yeah, we, we need you, but we need fighters." Um, and it was a charity event for Help the Heroes. Okay. Um, so it was a white collar event. Yes. So it's for beginners. Um, you know, all proceeds go to sort of Help the Heroes charity as well. And I looked at it and I just stood in the pouring down rain and I looked at it and I just kept on looking at it. And then I went, walked back, back into the co-op and asked for a, a bit of paper and a pen and went back out and, and wrote the number down. Okay. And then went back to my uh, my, my flat and um, I rang the number and it was a Hucknall Amateur Boxing Club. They were organising an event and spoke to the guy. His name's John Machin and he, he told me that there was uh, eight weeks worth of free basic training. And at the end of the eight weeks, you get to go and fight in front of all your friends and family, uh, and you get to bo- box in a boxing match. Um, and I decided to do it. So I, as soon as I was committed to that. I just went out, uh, I went to every session, yes. I didn't have a car at the time so um, one of my mates Scott already trained there so I sort of communicated with him, got got a lift with him, did the training, yeah. come back and did the training and, and I was always into boxing but that got me properly engrossed in it. Did he like give you like an appreciation it was, for what? It, it was, yeah I mean it, it got me disciplined so I was going out running and then all of a sudden as I was running more I mean, it, I even it sounds ridiculous, but I downloaded the um, the Rocky soundtrack on my <laughs> yeah, iPod, on, on my iPod Shuffle, <laughs> on my iPod Shuffle, and I used to go running around Bestwood Lodge, uh, which is like a forest behind where I yeah, live. Yeah, Bestwood Lodge. Yeah. Um, and then the weight started dropping off, and as the weight started dropping off, the confidence started going up, um, and I was getting fitter and fitter and fitter. And then off the back of feeling confident, I applied for a job. I got the job, nice. I got a company car, then nice. I could travel to the, the gym and do the training. And by the end of the eight weeks, I was, you know, I was in fairly good shape. I'd lost all this weight, I felt like a different guy. Yeah. So my like, life kind of took a complete U turn off, off the back of just committing to that. And then I went into this fight and I ended up I ended up winning. Okay. And I ended up winning convincingly as well. Um, but whilst I was there, points, it, it was it was a points win. Yeah, yeah. it was a points yeah. win. Oh, it's all right, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get many stoppages, but yeah, it's a points win. Um, but yeah, I went and won it, so it was that was the starting point. Nice, nice. I mean, do you think that does boxing does a lot of that for people? Because I see as a lot of people I know in boxing, they take it up because they need that discipline. And I'm not saying all people, but I find it a lot of, like I was saying to you when we was not recording. For me, I went boxing because I wanted to learn how to look after myself, mm. but it also did give me that discipline. Because mm. it kind of made me think like, well, you know when you know you can do something, you don't really have to show you can yeah. do it. Yeah. So it kind of just reigns you in a little bit exactly. as well. I mean, how did you go from fighting? How many fights did you have? I had uh, 10 fights in total. Okay. Mm. 
What's the record? Uh, record is uh, a one eight. Nice. Uh, I drew one and I lost one. Um, so I took a I took a title fight, uh, three fights in, Ooh. against a guy called Darren Snow and. Lomachenko. <laughs> no, no. He actually turned over pro though. Um, after he was quite strange actually. He's the only guy that beat me. And then a couple of years ago, I went to see. Remember when David Hay was fighting on on uh, that comedy channel? Yes, Dave. Yeah, 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 and he was Hay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone remember that. Yeah, 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 he fought, fought, fought Mark Demore um, at the O2. But Darren Snow, who turned over pro, who beat me, yeah. he was actually fighting on the undercard. Okay. So I was actually watching the guy that beat me in the O2. It was quite kind of surreal. surreal yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I did all right. I mean, I took it up very, very late. In, in, in I was going to say 33. Took it up at 33. Um, smashed out, you know, 10 fights in that time frame. Um, fortunately, what was the time frame? What was the time frame? Um, well, I. The last time I fought was a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, so I fought at the Motor Point Arena um, against a guy called Daniel Treacy, and that was for the, like, the Midlands uh, Cruiserweight title. And as I was sort of, um, you know, knocking on to 37 years of age, and I was fighting on that stage uh, in front of all those people, and I won that, I decided to, you know, just, you know, retire. Finish on a high. Finish on a high, yeah. And then I got, got into all the interviews and stuff after that. So that's what I was going to say, I mean, going from winning, what made you transition to just interviewing boxers? What, 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 where did this vision come from? It wasn't even, to, be, to be honest with you, Aaron, it wasn't even a sort of vision. I, did, I never thought that I was going to be getting into it. Um, <laughs> what happened was, at the Motor Point Arena event, they did press conferences and the weigh-ins as well, and I was a fighter at the press, conf press conference, so yeah. I'd never been on the top table at a press conference before. So we got all the cameras in front of us and you know I think there was like ITV news there because Lee Frotch was fighting yes. and there was shed loads of people there because it was Lee Frotch's um, Motor Point Arena debut, debut yeah. against Richie Leake. Um, and then I was on top the top table and they went down every fight to talking to them and all of a sudden when I spoke, I sort of engaged the, the audience straight away and. I felt found it very easy to talk in front of all those people because yeah, yeah, yeah. my day job is um, a business development manager, so I'm used to okay. used to talking in front of people. Yes. So um, I found it very very easy, and and then off the back of that, um, I did a bit of commentary work with a guy called Sam Barley, okay. who was who was doing the hosting at the time, and there was a lot of people saying to me that you know you, you've got you're good. good at this, you know you're really good at it, and then I obviously started to believe it. And then I just decided just to start doing interviews on my phone for the unlicensed yes. boxers. So I did Lee Froch, I did somebody else, um, did quite a few 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 fighters. And then one day um, I got a message from a guy called Scott Kalo, okay. who's a professional uh, boxing promoter, strength manager, and he does big events in Nottingham at the at the Harvey Adam. He's got okay. a lot of good fighters that fight for him, like Echo Esserman. He fights on his shows. He was great Britain, well, yeah. He's a he uh, well English. Well, he's now, a, he? Yeah, he's English welterweight champion. Yes. You know, Chad Sugden, very well known fighter as well. Um, and he said to me, Jack, I really like what you're doing. Like your interviews are good. Uh, do you fancy coming down to Hopeway Amateur Boxing Club to interview some pro boxers? And then after that, I went to interview them, and um, he said to me, there might be op an opportunity to do a media broadcast for the show. And I was up against Knotts TV. Um, and I was like, well, I'm not even media trained for one. I've got an iPhone, so I've got a second phone iPhone 7. <laughs> you know, I'm doing this at the minute without a microphone, and yes. I've got the opportunity to. To be fair, I kind of winged it because I didn't have a videographer, so I had to look for a third yeah. party to yeah. come and help me out, and I managed to do that. So I thought, I've got this, I've got this sorted, so I put a bit of a proposal together, and Scott was like, yeah, this is going to be great, let's go for it. But Knotts TV historically have done all the previous shows, so they've got a history That's of them, that, yeah. they've got relationships, and they've got 16 cameras, they've got the ability to stream live as well, and it'll be on TV. So two days before um, I was due to do it, yes. um, it, got, it got pulled from me, it got pulled. So they said, look, I'm, Scott was like, I'm really sorry, but Knotts TV are gonna do this. Um, they've got all the streaming kit, we need to get them on board. But you can still come down and you can still, easy, no, he said you still come down and do some backstage interviews. Okay. So I did that. Um, 
and I did like 10 to 15 interviews that night and then put them straight online. I think Knott's TV, no disrespect to Knott's TV because they're a great TV channel, but I yes. think they got not a lot of views, but my interviews on my phone, I think the, the, the biggest one that I got was a guy called Dylan Clegg, okay. who's a young boxer from, uh, he's very well known around his local area, he's a pro boxer, and uh, he, he smashed out like 15,000 views in one interview. Oh, yeah. and, and that's how, it's just after that, that's when it started sort of growing more. It's strange, it's, it's like you need that one hit, don't you? Once you get that one hit, mm. people are kind of like hooked there. I mean, your interviews, I've watched obviously a lot of your interviews, and they do seem to be going from strength to strength, just doing like the calibre of people you're interviewing. Mm. Has there been anyone that you've like, had a favourite interview of? Or? I've, got to, um, I could, I've got to thank one guy in particular, a guy called Lee Wood who's a yes, Commonwealth yeah, champ, yeah, yeah. he opened a lot of doors for me, um, I've known him for a while, um, I class him as a friend, yes. um, and he let me interview him before his Commonwealth title defence at the okay. Ice Arena in a, like a one-on-one one -on -one interview in the stands with his Commonwealth belt on him, you know, recently after he just won it, um, and that you know, secured about twelve thousand views in one in one go. But on the actual press conference for the Lee Wood press conference, mm -hmm. he let me interview him for that as well. So, you know, Lee Wood, you know, he opened some doors for me and he gave me some opportunities to progress further. So I'm I'm grateful for you know him doing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've had some big names. You know, yeah. Billy Joe Saunders. Uh, that was quite a funny funny one to be fair. That, that was the, that was the most poignant interview that I had, but it's the one that I cocked up on. Not because of how I was talking, yeah. something that happened. Come so, on then, share, <laughs> share the load. <laughs> so, I drove to Stevenage, yeah. to the press conference. Um, this was before he was fighting uh, against Dusafi for a world title. Um, and I, I was nervous about it because he's a, he's a big, big he's name. A big big name. name. He's, he's a really big yeah, name. Yeah, and he's a big name and he's Believe a camp. Yeah, he's he a, is elite. Yeah, right. he's a character as well, and like you know, it's I just it was he's a bit unpredictable. You don't really know what you're going to get with him. And um, sat and watched the press conference, and it was strange. Like Coogan Cassius was, was there, tap Coogan on the. It was surreal. I, t I tapped Coogan on the shoulder. I said, "Oh, Jack Fletcher Media Crooks is how you doing?" Um, and then Frank Warren, you know um, Ben Davison, Tyson Fury's coach, he was there as well. Yeah, yeah. And then they did the press conference. And then I went to speak to Tom Watt, who's Billy's sort of best mate, but he does all the tickets for him. And I said, uh, what happens next then? Because I'm new to this. How do I interview Billy then? He goes, well, you just need to go and stand up there and wait behind Michelle Joy Phelps. He's obviously, you yeah, know who she is, don't you? So I stood behind her and then, um, <laughs> then it was my interview. So I got, everyone else has got like Rode microphone, all the pro kit, there's me with my uh, second hand iPhone 7 like that, <laughs> pointing at Billy Joe Saunders like that. Um, and his kids are hanging off his shoulder and all that and I'm interviewing him and I got a three and a half minute interview out of him and I don't think it was my best work, yeah. but it was still a decent interview. I mean, sometimes when I do an interview and I don't think it's my best work, it sometimes it's- to be the best. It's, yeah, sometimes it smashes it. And I was, so I got it out of the way, got it done and I really wanted to go and watch it back to see you know how good it was. I was excited about seeing this interview, so I, I walked to, I I walked, I walked to the toilet and then went into the toilet and sat on the toilet. I didn't need the toilet, but I just sat on the toilet <laughs> and anyway, sat on the top of the toilet like that. And then got my phone out and looked at my phone and then went to play it. And all I could hear was nothing. Like, I, and then I fucking I looked down and then I realised that I'd not plugged my mic in properly. And I was like, my heart was just like. I kind of like half panicked and then I thought, oh God, no, this can't happen, like what? I ran out again and then I went to Billy again and said, you know, this, is, this has happened. He was not very forgiving, but he still gave me a little bit of his time okay. when we were walking. So I got a minute and a half, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was funny actually, but that's, that's, that was quite memorable. Yeah, yeah. If you look back, I laugh about it now, so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you learn from those things, don't you? Mm. When they come up now, but you're know, right. But what you're using now, I'm hoping you've upgraded from the uh, iPhone. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I've, I've got um, I've got camera equipment now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, still yeah. A, a, building, a raw building, novice. I'm still yeah. learning how to get everything together. Um, you know, 
So I've got I've got the stuff. I'm just sort of working it all out. So it's, uh, eventually it'll all sort of come together from a technology perspective as well. Yeah, definitely. So with the boxing now, obviously you're an avid fan, not just you know interview. Yeah. What do you think of the states? I mean, let's talk about first of all. I just want to talk about Andy Joshua quickly. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's finished? Do you think he should retire if he loses the rematch? No, I mean, I don't, do I don't think he should retire. Um, you know, he, at the end of the day, he's got a lot of ability. I mean, yes. people just talk about that one loss against Andy Ruiz. It was a bad day in the office. I mean, look at Joseph Parker. You know, yeah, he's high yeah, yeah. calibre. He, he beat Joseph Parker. He beat Dillian White. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be fair, I do think Dillian White is, 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 is a much better fighter now. Much improved. Yeah, I think if Dillian White fought Joshua now, I think... White would win. Potentially White would win. I, I, can't, I can't call it because Joshua, he could come back, revitalise yeah. as well. He could come back improved. I mean, a lot of the time, if you lose a fight, it can make you a better fighter. Yeah, 100%. And people are very quick to write AJ off. Um, I do think, to a point, AJ is is overrated to a point, but I do still think he's world class, and I still think he's got a lot left in his... Uh, in the of course, he's a young man. Yeah. He's a young man. This is what I think. I think Mayweather has, not only that ruined boxing, but that whole, everyone's got to have the up. That was a Mayweather thing. Like before, it was like you had people like others, but it wasn't really a big thing. Like people lost world champions, some of the greatest boxers that people think, yeah, they're the best. They lost, yeah, yeah. but no one ever talks about it. So for me, AJ, I do think again, same as you. I do think he's overrated. I think he's too stiff, mm. too muscle bound. Mm -hmm. When he gets hit, you can tell like he doesn't like it. Mm. But That's that true. being said. He's got ability, you can't mm. argue with that. I mean, he's done well in the Olympics. I mean, some people say that he can never win the final, mm -hmm. but he did, he got that. And he's got a good record. So I don't like, this is what I don't like about boxing, the British public, as soon as he lost, yeah. they want to tear yeah. him <laughs> down. Like one minute he's the king, yeah. then he's like, yeah. no, Shit, needs to yeah. retire. Yeah. So I'm like, calm down. It's just the way it goes with yeah. a fickle British public. I do think that it, if he fights Ruiz again, you have Ruiz be, wins. I think he, I think Ruiz could win again. Because yeah, this yeah, time round, Ruiz is gonna be more confident. Yes. In better shape. Yeah. You know. More yeah, more de matter. more determined to keep his titles as well. Um but AJ, you know, you Boxing is a strange sport. I mean, anything could happen. Yeah. So you can't write AJ off. Yeah, hundred percent. I think in terms of, like you said, with boxing now, there are some great fighters out mm. there. Who's like prospects that you see coming up? Because there's a guy from Nottingham. Don't mm. know if you've interviewed him yet. Mm. But I'm sure you will. His name's Ezra Cannon. Yeah, Ezra I mean the Cannon. Ezra Taylor. Yeah, Ezra um, Taylor. Ezra Taylor. Yes. Yeah, so um, one of my um, main sponsors, at BD8 Fitness. Um, he, Ezra's going to be a brand ambassador. Okay. So we're going to drop a, a tracksuit into him on Thursday. Now I've interviewed Ezra. Yes. Um, around a couple of months ago, and uh, he's he's won every amateur championship going. You know, he's even cool. been to, he's even been, been to different cities and, and won titles, amateur titles. I think he's been to Birmingham and won one. Maybe. Maybe. Um, but he, he he's like a young AJ almost. Yes. He reminds me of like a young AJ, but he's a bit lighter on his feet as well. Um, so. Yeah, he's a fan, fantastic prospect, and also a guy called Stan Stannard, okay. who's just been signed by Carl Greaves. Um, he's a fantastic fighter as well, and he, he's going to be he's going to go far. He's tipped to to either be signed by Frank Warren or Eddie Hearn at some point. He's right at the start of his journey at the minute. He's won many sort of. Well, he's just gone pro. He's just turned up a pro. Just, yeah, twenty one years old. Um, he's won like you know amateur titles, national championships. He's got many many belts. Uh, an unblemished record as well. So, okay. Stan and Ezra are the two sort of I'm main right sort of main guys that I can think of locally. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. I've seen Ezra fight like before. And he's like a friend Do you know him personally? Friends. Then? Yeah, yeah, like friends are friends. Like nice know, guy, isn't he? Ah, oh, super nice guy. He's got a good team around him mm. as well. Like all his pal. I know like a lot of boxers. Like he's been close friends with Frankie Gavin, and uh, a few other boxers from Birmingham, but. The difference is the teams, because Frankie Gabriel was a phenomenal fighter, mm -hmm. and he really was. 
but his outside situation. His friends wanted him to win, but they were doing other stuff, yeah. and he wanted to do <laughs> mm. other stuff. I mean, you can't do that in boxing. You know that, so it's, you, what you put in the ring is great, but mm. it's also what you're doing outside 100%. the ring. Mm. You know, so I think Ezra's definitely got a team mm. around him that are like really pushing him. Yeah. So I think you will and he's got that determination himself. Don't get me wrong. He, for, for his age, his his size and his physique oh, is yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. His power is phenomenal. Um, that's why no amateur boxers can live with a guy like that at that age. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. I think like, do you think it's is there much difference in being white collar? Amateur and pro. Is there now? I mean, because when White Collar first started, there wasn't. Mm. Because, like I say, you could turn up on the night and fight. Mm. I remember going to shows literally and people mm. was turning up going, Yeah, I want to jump in and fight. Mm. And I never allowed. But now it's a bit more regulated. Yeah. You know, you've got the, like you say, eight week training camp for everyone. Mm. What, do you do you mean in terms of, what do you mean in terms of skill sets or regulations? Um, well, both really. Let's, let's go with skill set first, because mm. obviously, you know, we, we hear a lot of pros or amateurs who are solid amateurs, mm. like, you know, they're far above everyone else, but don't quite seem to make it mm. pro. Mm. Um, why is that? What's the, what is the difference in skill set, do you think? I think, um, if, you know, if you're an amateur fighter, mm. you know, and you get trained by the right people and you've got the right team around you and you're yeah. committed, no um, you've got, um, you know, you've got all every chance in the world of becoming a professional. Yeah. In the unlicensed game, you know, these guys, majority haven't got the same skill set. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Or, or the, uh, the the best training. I mean, when you get to an amateur gym, naturally the training is going to be better. Yeah, yeah, but you do get the odd golden gem that, you know, is a licensed fighter that has got just that, um, that ability to get into the professional game. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one Sam Eginton. Yeah, Sa Sam Eginton is a local guy called Joe Hughes as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, he, he started off, I think he started off white collar and then he went into um, unlicensed boxing, absolutely yeah. smashed it, and now he's been signed by Scott Kalo and now he's two and two. So you yeah. do get the odd person from an unlicensed background that goes professional, um, but normally it's the, it's the amateur pedigree that will normally, you know, make right it to the top. make it to the top. I mean, Stan Stanard is a prime example, um, and uh, Ezra as well. Yeah, Those yeah. two guys are amateurs. They've been amateur boxing from a very young age, and Ezra, I'd probably give him what twelve months before he turns over pro. Right, yeah, and, yeah. and Stan Stanard, he's already turned over pro. But a lot of these guys, they start amateur from a very early age. They, they box from like six, seven, eight years old. Yes. Now. Take for example myself, I didn't start on licensed boxing until I was 30, right, 30, 33 yeah, yeah, years yeah, old. Yeah. But what would have happened if I would have started when I was eight years old? You know. Yeah, it's true. So it's true. Hmm. I think um, in terms of have you ever seen much now these days? There's a lot in Birmingham. It's growing like massive. BKB. BKB. Yeah, bare knuckle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. What do you think of it, man? Like, I see here in Birmingham, they're growing because mm. we had like a world champion. We've got like Ricky Taylor, or Ricky mm. Naldo, sorry, I should say. We've got Trez, who's the British champion. We've got James Kennelly, mm. who's out there fighting. There's a lot of fighters in Birmingham with John Tunney. Um, I love it, I do. Like, I yeah. watched it, yeah. and I think, first of all, we'll never do it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why? I like my brain cells. <laughs> I like my face too. <laughs> um, that's what I really. Um, but they are warriors. Are they boxers? Is bare knuckle for? I know it's bare knuckle boxing, but is it the no, same? No, it's, it's, it's a different is game, it? isn't it? I mean, bare knuckle and boxing is a different game altogether, to a point. Yeah. Um, Still a sport though, you know, there's still a skill set involved. Oh, 100%. But 100%. I think it, you can kind of. Um, Finish a fight a lot quicker in bare knuckle boxing. Yes. Uh, it's all guns blazing a lot of the time, uh, but it's Let's pure. Let's pure on the job. It's entertainment as well. Uh, but but hats off to anybody, anybody, whether it be bare knuckle boxing, oh, yeah, the Warriors, you right. know, boxing, UFC, whatever. If it, so any man that gets into a ring mm. and fights, he's, he's got my utmost respect because it takes a certain type of uh, of human being to be able to do that, and it, it makes me laugh how these these armchair guys. Oh, never put on a pair of boxing gloves in their Xbox. life. They've never fought, but they're yeah. very quick to criticise people. Or if someone gets knocked out, oh, he's not very good. But 
you don't know what it feels like to be in that dressing room, like knowing that it, when you get through those ropes, you know, walk into the room. You, it's the loneliest place in the world. There's mm. nobody there. It's yeah, like yeah. it's do or die. So, you know, being knuckle boxing, boxing, any sport that involves like a one to one duel, like, you know, maximum respect. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'll take my hats off to anyone. What do you think, like, in terms of Jack Fletcher Media Productions, you've had exponential growth. So you're talking five months, you know, socials are going through the roof, you get getting to interview high caliber fires now. What, what's like the plan? Is there like a grandmaster plan? Is it in five years, you know, you want to be doing all sports or you just want to stick to boxing? Because I know you had that thing with Matchroom recently, mm. which you narrowly missed out on, was it? Yeah, I put in an application for a, a media pass for um, the Dillian White Revas fight. Okay. Um, so off the back of the first Matchroom event, sort of built a relationship with their, me their head of media um, and I thought that there was a good chance I'd get on it. Um, but I narrowly missed out, but it, that was always, looking back in retrospect, that was always going to happen because, you know, I'm five months in, you've got IFL TV, Seconds Out, Boxing Social, you've got all the big guns, so, you know, I, I strongly believe that I'm just as good Yes. as these guys are interviewing, if yeah, not yeah. better, I yes. do. Yeah, yeah. But I've just not got the, uh, the following at the minute and I've not got the uh, maybe the technology as well, but I know that I've got the the, raw, the, abil the ability to be able to go there and, and get good interviews out of people. So I didn't get that, but I did get the ultimate boxer um, in okay. Altrincham. So nice. I, I applied for two and I got the ultimate boxer. So that was a good experience. So I met Steve Bunce. Okay, yeah, he was yeah. a boxing co commentator and um, I got some good exclusives with um, with a lot of the fighters there so that was a good experience but yeah I missed out on that but my long term plan um, just keep keep growing the channel Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think the more I keep growing the channel the more I keep getting in front of the right people the, the, the better interviews that I do the more recognition I'm going to get and if I've got self belief which I have I strongly believe that I haven't even got any doubt in my mind that I'm going to get to where I need to be to but it might take a year, it might take two years, I might get a lucky break six months down the line. I don't know, but you know, um, last week I drove all the way to Trowbridge um, in yeah. Wiltshire. Um, yeah. It was 180 miles there and 180 miles back, and I interviewed Nick Blackwell, nice. who um, obviously Nick Blackwell obviously like, had yeah. that accident a couple of years ago and got retired by Eubank. Um, but it was a sensitive interview. It wasn't just like I was going there and for a quick interview. I wanted to sit down and chat with him, and I didn't want to just know him. Yeah, get to know him, but I just yeah. didn't want to focus on 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 on, on, on fight. I wanted because what people forget is Nick Blackwell. Before before what happened happened, yeah. you know, he was a great boxer. Yeah, he won a lot of titles. Um, you know, he'd, he'd done twelve rounds with Billy Joe Saunders, fought the likes of Martin Murray, and he's he's a high caliber fighter. Um, so I just wanted to focus on that, but. Talking about the, the Eubank situation was unavoidable, and we had to course, talk about it. Course. And he even told me afterwards, because I said to him, I watched it, because I went to an event at the RV Adam, and I weren't commentating or doing any uh, interviews then, but I just went to an event, and I come back, and I watched the back end of the fight, and Nick Blackwell, I went to my mum and dad's and watched it, and I saw what was happening, and he, he was just, he was taking oh, some yeah. massive shots, some yes. massive uppercuts, but he just kept walking forward, and I thought, this guy's chin, he's just like, Granny. Unbelievable. <laughs> and I brought it to his attention in the interview and he told me after the interview when I was talking to him that the ears were standing up on his arms when he, when we were talking about it. But he was such a lovely bloke yeah. and people say, Oh he's not oh he's not right anymore, is he? Oh he, he you know, he, he don't he don't look right anymore. And he, you know, he's got obviously problems after he's got yeah, a brain injury. Yeah, but you know, he's just that same guy as he was you know, yeah. two or three years ago. So and that's how I've, that's how it needs to be treated. So I went there, did a crack interview, but that's that's the commitment that I've got to what I'm doing. You know, yeah. dri driving 400 miles in one day to interview one person, so. Do you find it hard when you're, it's like when I do a podcast, it's certain people that know something has happened. People don't necessarily want to talk about that, but for your audience, that is what they want to hear about. So how do you judge that when you're talking to the five? Because obviously I know you did the Dillian White interview yeah. and you tried to get it out of him. 
Mm. Yeah, but it's like straight away, it's like, I can't talk about it, mate. You know, so when do you, do you kind of feel that, you know, or do you already have your mind like, right, I need to get, I need to think of the audience, or I need to think of the fighter? Every interview that I've done, I go into it totally unplanned. Okay. Like, so I don't, don't have... I don't write five questions on, on the back of my hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've not got any notes in my phone. Even if I'm doing an interview, which is sort of 400, 200 miles away, I still yeah. don't plan it. At all, like I tell, and before I start the interview, I say to the the, the the guy that I'm interviewing, "This is just totally unplanned. We're just gonna have a chat about boxing, and yes. then and then we get into it." But um, Dillian White is a is a prime example of, of of that situation. So, Ty Mitchell won his fight. Obviously, Dillian White is friends with Ty Mitchell, Ty, and and Di, no, Ty Mitchell won his fight. Dillian White's walking through. All of a sudden, before everybody was pounced on Dillian White, I, I went up to him, because you had to have bollocks as well. So I went up to yeah, him yeah. and said, Dillian, can I just grab you for a minute for an interview? And he said, he said, yeah, 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 no problem. And he walked over to my stands, and obviously I started off by talking about Ty Mitchell. He's here to support Ty. Thank He's you. here to support Lee Frotch, because he knows Lee, Lee Frotch as well. And um, he, he, he started talking about it, and then for me, it was a 50 50. So if I don't ask the question, then I'll, I'll, I'll regret it because yeah. at the end of the day, like I could have I could have stood there for four or five minutes and skirted around it and talked all about the event, all about everything else apart yeah. from that. But the elephant in the room is saying, Jack, Jack, people be watching it going, why have you not fucking asked Why have you not yeah. asked the guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why have you not asked the guy? But looking in retrospect, I asked the question. But I feel like I probably asked it a little bit too early. I went in. Okay. I went in where I should have like like warmed it, warmed yeah, it, warmed yeah, it up yeah. a bit, and then dropped it in. But at the end of the day, he didn't want to answer it, and respect to him because you know at the end of it, it's a legal matter. And yeah, that's fair course, enough. Yeah. I've seen reports that he's he's innocent. Now I've seen so a few things online that, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. It's a bit of a grey area. He didn't want to talk about it, and I sort of almost felt a little bit bad for asking question because he kind of walked off it he killed the interview that's what i mean that's what i'm saying so for you personally I, I, and that's what i seen i seen like it looked good it was all like and then it was like ah, oh, you asked that one question and it's just bam. i felt like i had to ask it though yeah, yeah, yeah and then when he walked off i said dillian like i'm sorry for jumping in on that question question maybe should have spoke let, to him let, after he, spoke to him after and he was absolutely cool he was yeah, fine yeah, yeah. shut my hand and we had a picture together and he said, oh, Jack, listen, um, it's just, I can't talk about it. It's a, it's a legal matter, so I'm not allowed to speak about it. Yeah. But can you imagine if we did talk about it? Can you imagine if we talked about it and talked about it in depth? Yes. And nobody else has got that interview. And then I put it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it got to take the risks. It was a 50-50, so. And at the end of the day, whichever way you look at it, I'm asking the questions that people want the answers to. Yes. So I, I always... It's because I want to know. And yeah, I think if I want to, if I want to know, then and I'm a boxing fan, and you're going to want to know. Yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, I think that was like a massive scoop as well because I think personally, I was going to say out there, I am a team body snatcher. I'm a fan. Mm. Like I wasn't always a fan, but he's winning me round. I think when I, you see a fighter and he's willing to take any fight, there's no. You know, no nothing is willing to fight people. That's one thing I can say. I just love that in a fight. It's too much red tape in boxing. Like, do you think this has all just come out? Is this a plot? This whole drugs. Ah, mm. uh, he's you know he's gonna get an eight year ban. Is this to sully his name? Is this to get him away from a wilder fight? Is this is this just you know? I, don't, I honestly don't know. It's very confusing. I'd, 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 I'd like to think that he's completely innocent because, like you said, I mean, a year ago, he didn't have many fans because no. people got him wrong and people always judge people too soon. Yes. You know, he seemed to be arrogant. You know, he was. He seemed to be like rude and obnoxious and yada yada yada. But when you get to know Dillian White properly. I mean, I don't know him on a personal level, but I know people that know him that he's sound. And I met him myself the other night, and he was absolutely brilliant with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, the fights that he takes. I mean, Joseph Parker, you know, um, Rivas. He mm -hmm. don't care. He'll take the fight, and he's an improving fighter as well. Mm -hmm. Like with AJ, 
there's, there's a question mark on whether he can get any better, or is he it's his plateau. But with Dillian White, he's just he's getting better. He's growing and getting better. He's working off his jab more. You know, he's he's turning into a proper good boxer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he's a likable guy. So you know, I I hope he's I hope he's innocent. I hope he does get that shot with Wilder. Yeah, definitely, mm. definitely. I think you should. So, I want to do a quick thing. Have you seen it go around on Facebook at the minute? The, um, oh, I think I know what you're going to say. The best fight, uh, yeah, 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 right. right. So, oh. I haven't seen yours. I don't know if you threw it up. No, I didn't. I, didn't, I, didn't do, I read it and I thought, I was meaning to do it, but I never got around to it. So, right, I'm going to do that now. Yeah, now see what, see what you've got. Let me just get the questions. I can't remember right. what they are. So the first one I know is, who's the most overrated fighter? Flipping out, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because I'm going to say what well, you think. On my mate's pop, and it's, if it's Mike Tyson's the most overrated fighter ever. Mm. And he put, <laughs> me and he was having an argument about it, because he put like, any real fight he had, he lost. Mm. And I was like, he was having a real fight since he was 16. He was fighting 40 year old men. Mm. Now, to me, obviously with cost dying and you know things like that, his head was wobbled. When he fought uh, Boss Douglas lost, mm. he'd been doing cocaine the night before, mm. drinking, do you know what I mean? Like, he weren't training. So, when you say he's underrated, I think that's just silly. Mm. But don't let that influence your answer. <laughs> um. I don't know why, but my, my, my brain's telling me George Groves. Really? Mm. You think he was overrated? Mm. I think that he, he's very chinny. Okay. okay. So, you know, every time he's been up against somebody who has got a bang on them, yes. he's ended up on the deck. Get, be getting, like a bit get, getting knocked <laughs> out, yeah, <laughs> getting knocked out. Um, a lot of people are saying AJ, but I, I can't, you know, I, I don't agree with that. Not, not off the back of like that, that fight, no. Um, it is a real tough question because they've, they've all got credibility in their own right and maybe it's a little bit unfair to say George Groves but you know for you every time he's 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 come up against somebody who's who's of a top calibre he's he's got he's got beat like yeah, yeah, Callum yeah. Smith you know yes. he had the fight against Callum Smith and he I mean he's only he's only 30 years old and he's already retired so um, I think he's 30 years old I'm probably I sure he's, I think, no I think he's I think he's 33 now is he yeah um, yeah I mean he, he couldn't against Callum Smith he got knocked out um, he he was giving it the big one against uh, Carl Froch he got knocked out um, I think he fought Badu Jack in America yeah, he yeah, got right. beat yeah, yeah you yeah. know so Badu Jack's a good fighter he's a brilliant fighter yeah yeah I was going to say um, good fighter so I'd probably go with that George Gray. Why is it with the boxers? Because, and then the reason why I say that is, um, George Groves, oh my God, no, it's got blue, it's blue. When he fought, I just realized I don't think you're gonna get into at George Groves now, at any point. <laughs> this, is, this is real talk. <laughs> You'll never hear this, don't worry. <laughs> All right, so that's overrated, underrated, who doesn't get the, the props they deserve? You know, I think he's a very underrated fighter. A guy called Bob Adjusef. Okay, not heard of him. He's so. from Sheffield. Um, he's ranked fourth in Britain. Okay. Um, what weight? He's, um, I think he's light heavyweight. Okay. okay. Yeah. He's fought on Channel 5, um, Maxim Power Nutrition, uh, yeah. tournament on that. Um, he's fought a lot. A lot of top calibre lads as well, and he's won. And a lot of people, you know, duck him, they don't want to fight him. Um, so I'd say Bob Adjusef. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a wild card answer. That yeah, yeah. Like, I don't think I'll find anyone else with yeah. that. So mm -hmm. I'm going to look him up and I'll go around. Yeah, do that. that. Really nice bloke, actually. I interviewed him a couple of months ago. He's recently won a fight um, in, I think it was Rotherham who was fighting. So he's a, he's a great fighter. He's ranked fourth, but a lot of fighters don't want to fight him. Okay. Because yeah, he's yeah. dangerous. So they'll avoid him. And that's why he's not getting the opportunities that he deserves. Well, I was going to say that. Do you think in bo do you think in boxing, because there's so many governing bodies, you can do that? Do you think if there's one governing body, so listen, there's one bout, mm. you've got the bout, there's rank, like half the fight, like mm. in that. Because there's 
three, four different governing bodies. It's kind of like, well, I don't really, I can dock that guy and go to over there yeah. and fight this guy. Yeah. Would it be better if they had one battle? Yeah. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it would be, but obviously with, with the different sort of divisions and, and belts, it makes it more interesting, but yeah. it's all about the promoters and money making at the end of the day. 100%. If they've got a guy who comes in that they know is a, is a, is a danger that's not really that popular and they not it's, not worth, the it's not worth the money so it's it's a it's money making it's all yeah. about the promoters and how they're gonna you know get to the point where their fighters make as much money as possible for the yeah, promotion a, team at the end of the day it is a business isn't it yeah of course you have is. to remember that like, you know when bit of one says like oh aj is docking so and so or wilder's docking so and so mm. realistically you do think or the docking fury you gonna go with the money? Are you gonna go with the money is, or are you gonna go where the respect of the audience? Exactly. Is, I suppose. I think. I think the, the thing is with this, they've got to give the fighter as many fights as possible to get the bank balance up as much as possible. Yes. But yeah. it, it comes to a point where there's a it's there's a definitive point where they've got to fight that person. But they, it's all about taking the slow and steady steps to, to get as much money piled up as possible. I mean, AJ is an example, Eddie Earn. Like, yeah, he yeah, took yeah. like many, many, many fights against, you know, Average. guys that weren't that great until yeah. a point where he had to, you Fight, know, up, yeah. up the fighting calibre, you know, and then Joseph Parker and Dillian White, and then- but that's like everyone, that's every fight, yeah. isn't it? If you come in your first 10 fights, you're fighting people. Well, if they think you're elite, so if you've just come from the Olympics and you've got, you know your first time fighters, exactly. you should be able to walk through. Yeah, really. really. Yeah. And then you start to step it up, you go to you know, British level, then you're going to go to European That's level, right, yeah. then you're going to go to world level. Mm. But once you get to that world level, like this is a different side, like, in heavyweight, especially in heavyweight, there really isn't that many fighters. Mm. So it's kind of like, when everyone's talking about everyone else's record, to say, mm. well, AJ mm. hasn't fought anyone, mm. Like this is a, especially Americans that say AJ ain't fought no one. I'm like, well, he's just what Wilder's fought no one either. Mm. Really, he fought Fury, mm. obviously, which he lost me. Really, but we won't go into that. Mm. <laughs> you know, so who's who's to say like when they say, well, he hasn't fought anyone? Like, I look at AJ and Wilder's mm. record, especially, mm. and I think they're exactly the same. Yeah. They're very similar, they're like the calibre of fighters. You can't say, oh, he's fought no one, because mm. you've fought no one as well. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly the same fighters. When you've only got four people who are actually elite mm. in your division, mm. you can't dock them forever. Exactly. You can't, like, it's impossible. Mm. So you're going to fight shit people for, you yeah, know, yeah. Think, oh, it's a waste of time. But look at Ruiz. Everyone thought AJ uh, was going to walk through that fight. That, yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was in London at the time um, and I actually missed the fight. Um, I was at a party and then I come out of the party afterwards. And I was in the middle of London and um, I wanted to know what the fight result was. And I was asking people and they said, oh, AJ lost. And I just couldn't believe it. I thought people, <laughs> were, I thought people were trying to wind me up. I just couldn't believe it. And then I got, back, I got back to the hotel and I was looking. It was like, I looked at this guy, Ruby's, and I thought, flipping hell, look at this guy. He doesn't even look like a book boxer. He looks looks like yeah, a bus, yeah, looks yeah, like yeah, a bus yeah. driver. Yes. Yeah. Um, but never judge a book by its cover. I mean, 100%. and then I watched the fight back, and he, he, he it was a phenomenal performance from Ruiz, wasn't it? It was. And you know what? He's actually a good fighter. He is a very good. That's fighter. the thing as well. He obviously went the Olympics and done well. He's got a great he, amateur background. Yes, I mean, had a good amateur background, and it was actually like I was listening to a lot of the uh, like American context. Obviously, they just had a great knowledge than anyone over yeah. it. And I was saying like the guy who was AJ meant to fight, I can't remember now. Oh Baby Miller. He was yeah Baby Miller. I the, think if it, I think if he fought Miller He would have won. He would have won. Yeah yeah. Hundred percent. Yes, yeah. Because the fight was settled for him to win. Yeah. That's just what people are saying. People are saying that Ruiz is actually a harder fight than Miller. Mm, definitely. To have so to take it on after. But yeah. people didn't do their homework on Ruiz, did they, until afterwards? And when you look into Ruiz's record and his, his, his credibility and who he's fought, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think he's only lost one fight on points to Joseph Parker. Joseph Parker, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and for a guy of his size, his hands are so fast. Powerful as well. Powerful as well, Powerful yeah. As so. well. Mm. That'll be a good fight. I'm looking forward to seeing that, uh, the rematch. Um, right then, so, biggest disappointment? Who you just thought, oh no, nah, maybe should have. Biggest disappointment. I'd probably say AJ. 
because I really want him to win that fight. <laughs> I think the whole of the UK was gutted at yeah, first, yeah, and then yeah. the fickle boxing fans turned on him. Yes. But, you know, it, it would have been nice for AJ to win that fight. Definitely. And it would have been nice for it to be like an AJ Fury climax, which still might potentially happen. It could. We'll see. We'll s- I don't know. I don't know if that fight Fury's will untouchable, to though, to be fair. I don't Do you think he's the elite? He's the elite. I'll but tell you a story, right? It's when I was 16. Me and my pal. I've got a pal called Louis Henderson. I won't throw your name out there. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Louis Henderson. And basically, we're 16. We're in a pub over the road just down there. And it's New Year's Eve. No, the day before New Year's Eve. Well, like the local mm. scallies, you know. I'm not really invited to no parties. So we're having <laughs> a pint at this pub. I'm just going home. So I've walked to my house, he's walked to his house. By the time I got to my front door, he's mm-hmm. wrong me and he's gone. Should we go my bed tomorrow? <laughs> so I'm like, yes, yeah, sweet, let's go. <laughs> so imagine this now, we've gone, yeah. picked up now, the next day his mum dropped us to um, some service station somewhere. We met this geezer, some uh, gypsy geezer. He's a gypsy geezer. He's give us about 30 grand in cash. That's a problem more than that. Well, but, He's like, it's gone to, gone to a mate Louis. So he says, listen, when you go over there and see your uncle, mm-hmm. give him this money for me. Mm-hmm. He says, if anyone asks you about it beforehand, mm-hmm. don't say anything. You're just buying an apartment, cash deposit. They ask you anything else, don't say anything. It's well, like kids, you know, you got that much cash on you, you're like, yeah, I'm the man. Like, <laughs> you're like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're like, yeah, sweet. So look, we've gone for the airport, everything's sweet. We meet his uncle, his now his uncle, I wanna say his uncle's name, but his uncle's there, comes picks us up. Right. He's uh come picked us up now, you know, like a beside his G wagon, probably put major by sixteen as well, so we're okay. thinking we are the shit. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we've gone into we stayed at the Kopinski Hotel in mm. uh, uh penthouse above Oliver Khan and Eureka Johnson mm. and he's okay. like, lads, you you've got this for like two weeks. Just yeah. anything you want, just put it on this tab, mm. nothing. So anyway, we're there for the first week, the second week comes out, boom. It's took us out to the mountains. Okay. Right. So now all his family's there. Ben wants his my mate's family, his uncle. So I go into the room, who's there? Tyson Fury. Peter Fury. Right. Tony Fury. Yeah, he's, they're all his cousins. Right, all okay. his first cousins. Cousin. Yeah, yeah, so this is like, but at this time, they're not the kids, like we're all yeah. kids, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's kind of like, mate, I remember waking up Peter Fury, like, I'm in this apartment at mm-hmm. like, the mountains. I'm like, do you know what alarm starts going off. I'm like, mate, it's like half five in the morning. I'm like, yeah. no, we're all going running. I'm like, oh my God. Wow. Like, like when I say, you know, the Furies are people, right? I think it's like an act, but bro, they're bred yeah. for fighting. They are, for yeah. boxing, they're yeah. fighting people. They're fighting people, like, yeah. proper, and that's one of the maddest stories I ever told. It's surreal, like, mate. Yeah, like it's it's crazy. I remember his brother died a few years back, mm-hmm. and we went to a funeral. And again, oh, you had like, a lot of boxers there, so that's the man. He died in funeral or like that. And when I say like it was a proper gypsy funeral, and when it's kicked off, it kicked off at the funeral. Oh, was he fighting? Yeah. Was he? Yeah, man, it was crazy. Was it crazy funeral, man? But yeah, it's a great. Story. Good story. Yeah, good story. Yeah. <laughs> But we definitely, uh, we had some mad times. I wasn't expecting that, good story mate. Yeah, yeah, we had some mad times with, trust me, because like, we used to go to Manchester and mm. I remember my idea. <laughs> but it was good. Um, Alright, so, next one. You did most under, uh, no, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Favourite boxer of all time. Favourite boxer of all time. Mm. That's a very, very good question. I might seem a little bit biased when I say this, but I, I've got to go for Carl Froch. Okay, okay. Got to, no, 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 yeah, no, 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 no. you know, he's the, he's the one boxer that I, you know, I grew up on here. Grew right? up on him. You know, watched all his fights. Jimmy yeah. Taylor, Gene Pascal. You know, he was George Groves. I've seen him. I've watched watched him in fights where he's gone abroad. He's got knocked down, and then he's Man. got like ten seconds to knock this guy out, and he ends up knocking him out. Um, well, let's come from a warrior family as well, anyway. His old man used to be like probably mm. top top notch in Nottingham. You know, he did, yeah. Doors, he yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, know, you, you know your history there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They used to, they used to run the show, ain't it? Like, he's a four-time world champion. Yeah, um, he retired on top. Um, 
Oh, you'd love to see Moon vs Kawasaki. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see that. I put a post up uh, a couple of days ago about that and asking people what they think, you know, think about who, who would have won that fight. Um, yeah, it's the best fight that never happened, I think. Yeah. It would have been an absolute war between those two. Um, majority of people are saying Kawasaki would have beat him, but what's your thoughts? I think... Like Kawasaki like in his prime, my name. What's, what's your thoughts? <laughs> Kawasaki in his prime, I think probably would have won, but I think like his hands were finished right now. Mm. And I just think Frotch probably would have done him on, mm. the, on, the, on the off. I think Frotch was more of a warrior. Mm. I think when it come to digging deep, I just think that Frotch would have outdone him. Personally, mm. maybe that's just because I've been in that for the last eight years. <laughs> if I was in Wales, but maybe I'd differently. The <laughs> thing is, we've seen it, haven't we, against Kessler? Yeah, that's what I mean. You know, the amount of shots that he took against Kessler in that second fight and still come back and won, and then getting knocked down and getting back up and then winning the fight, you know, he's done, he's done everything. Every possible scenario you could think of yeah, in yeah, a boxer's yeah. career, he's done it. And then the way he capped his career off, I know a lot of people, you know, a lot of people like him, a lot of people think he's arrogant and don't like him. Yeah, yeah. I know him personally as well, and he's a, he's a, he's a decent decent guy. Um, you have yeah. to have a bit of arrogance though, this is the thing I think. I think when you're a fighter, when you in fact not even a fighter, when you're at the elite in anything, whether you're the elite surgeon, the elite footballer, the elite whatever you're the elite at, got to have that bit of arrogance. Yeah, of course you have, otherwise think, you'd be boring. <laughs> yeah, but not even that, I think it's just that level of self-belief. Yeah. I think if you don't have that level of self-belief that you are the best, yeah. you ain't gonna make it. Yeah. And I actually think that's happened with AJ. Mm -hmm. I watched an interview with AJ on the Breakfast Club. Yeah. Before the Ruiz fight. And all he kept talking about was losing. The whole interview. Mm, yeah. Oh, you know, if you lose, you know, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Oh, you know, if I lose, I'll come back and, you know, I'll still be, you know. Mindset. I'll still be on my mind. But why you keep talking about, like, you're talking like you're going to lose the fight. Your yeah. mindset. I'm not going to go into, like, I know his mindset, but don't talk about losing. I like this whole stay humble thing. Mm. But just fucking, sometimes you just got to say, I'm going to knock you the fuck out. If you look at Conor McGregor <laughs> yes. and his mindset, his mindset was all about visualising winning. Like I don't yeah. know if you've seen that um, that documentary, Notorious. No, nah, I haven't seen it. It's seen worth it. watching. Is it? It's, it's the best hour and a half you'll watch on, okay. on, on, on a film. So it was a documentary about his um, about his life in the early days when he was yes. living in like a one bedroom flat with his missus in Ireland. And then he was even saying on on the camera then, so there must have been a camera set up like that in the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he was saying that one day I'm going to be a world champion. UFC champion and he went through all his local MMA fights all the way through he's talking about mindset talking about how he's going to um, you know get to the top be at the top and he must have done like a, a home documentary all the way through because yeah, at the yeah. start it was very authentic he had no tattoos on his chest at all so you tell it was real because he's got that big dragon on his chest now yes. loads of tattoos um, and then he, he won a cage rage and then he went out and bought a Range Rover and then he had his first UFC fight and then won that. And then he got to a point where he's gone from being in a one bedroom flat in Ireland with his missus to being in like a well, massive like sports, five man. million pound mansion <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. or more in America. He's got Arnold Schwarzenegger knocking on his door. Arnold Schwarzenegger's coming into his house and wishing him good luck for his fight. And that's all about mindset. He, he, he emphasises mindset so much I do think that if you visualise something in your mind, yeah, yeah, you can make it happen, but you have to have that light. You have to take, you very dangerous, I think what a lot of people mm. do is, they say, oh, I love like reading books, like, you know, the law of attraction, and, you know, think rich, grow rich, and it's all about, I'm going to will it into the universe. Yeah, you can will it into the universe, but you still have to do put, it. Yeah, yeah, you still have to put them hard yards. Action. In. Yeah, that's it. You can't say, oh, I'm going to yeah. be rich, and then sit back and be like, yeah, yeah. What's happening? Why, why, why is my bank balance still at more than five hundred? It's action and law of attraction. Yeah, yeah in, definitely uh, combined. You know, combined. Yeah, I totally agree. All right, then. So that was your favourite boxer in the last book. Is your favourite the greatest? Who's the greatest of all time? The greatest of all time is he's got to be Muhammad Ali. Okay, but is that t strictly for boxing, or are we talking about just? 
every oh, film. You know my favourite boxer of all time. This is what I want to know. Oh, Mike Your Tyson. Favorite. Mike Tyson. Thank you. Yeah. Mike Tyson. He's my favourite boxer. You could watch Mike Tyson on a show reel yeah, yeah, for yeah. hours. He's my favourite boxer of all time. You know, mm-hmm. knockout, ferocious knockout power. No, but technically it was amazing. Like, yeah. This is what I say to people. Like when people say, "No, he wasn't that good on my movement," you don't know anything. Like he's, he was so, so small and that. Like, he, he was actually that <coughs> unpredictable with his movement with yeah. when Cost trained. Him, yeah, that you didn't know what he was gonna do. But as soon as Cost died, what's happened is when uh, his pad man has gone. Mm. Oh, this is what I thought about. Not what happened. What I didn't mm. happen is he's gone into a basic trainer. Dunking crime someone who's just going, right Mike, one two, one two, yeah. one two. Mm-hmm. So people could then read his shots and I think that's unfortunately was part of his downfall. Obviously, I think his old demeanour as well. I mean he was edgy, he was a character, he was controversial. Yeah. Um you know, and he was just a very, very good boxer, wasn't he? And he was just it was just a pleasure to watch. Yeah. You know, even like Prince Nazim as well. Yes. He's another guy that was it was it was also one of my favourite boxers. Yeah, he's showing him coming on a fucking magic carpet. <laughs> yeah, remember that? Remember that? Yeah, yeah. That's the best great. entrance ever. <laughs> so Mike Tyson, number one. And then same for Hardy's puncher. One now. Wilder. Wild. Oh yeah, true. Mm. Yeah, I think he's got part of him Tyson. He's got really. on a par. No, probably more. He's probably got, yeah, he's probably he more. Is. I mean, if you look at how um, unorthodox as two well. fights, right? Look at look at the way he hit Dominic Brazil. Oh yeah, yeah. Knocked him, knocked him like a, he was out like a sack of potatoes, wasn't he? Definitely. Uh, Stavern as well. He just took him apart. He's Ferocious knockout power. The, the hardest puncher on planet Earth at the minute is Deontay Wilder. Bomb, yeah, definitely, bomb squad. Definitely. And then best trainer. Best trainer. Mm. Freddie Roach, okay. he's at the top of the tree. Yeah, Freddie yeah, Roach, yeah. I see Freddie Roach. Mm, I'd go for Freddie Roach on that. Come on, it's a good list. I think we've got like, you know, I'd say Rob McCracken's a great trainer. Yeah, he's a great trainer. Yeah, he is a great mm. trainer. I know like, when you're talking about stable mates, but he's got some big names and mm. done some real mm. good foot. I mean, he transformed British boxing, I think. Mm. When he went down there, you know, got the centre set up in Sheffield. You know, none of that would have happened yeah, without yeah. him. Before it was, that was going to some shit gym. Mm. Like, they had nothing, literally. And now it's like, the, you know, the academy, they're out there getting through the yeah. Olympics and, you know, going on to yeah, world title yeah. fights. And so I would 100%, personally mate. put him in there for me, personally. What he did with Frotch as well, what he did with AJ. Yeah, this you is know. what I mean. Like, it's, it's one of them, man. Mm. I mean, everyone's got their own their own take on boxing this is what that's what makes it great though because if everyone just thought the same thing you know it'd be boring yeah man we're done okay mate for the hour listen it was a pleasure to have you down you too um i wish you all the best and obviously we're gonna see i know you're gonna do big things i always say visualize so yeah man Cheers, Aaron. listen thanks pal yeah pleasure nice one always and guys that's the end of politics and bullshit fight week Done.